It's a great pleasure for me to introduce you, uh, our keynote speaker for uh, this morning, uh, Dr. Rafael Luna. Uh, Rafael is uh, uh, well known to us. Uh, he ended up getting his bachelor's in biological sciences from Southern University, and he came to LSU as part of the Department of Biological Sciences and uh, finished his PhD uh, in my laboratory working on Kaposi sarcoma herpes virus. And uh, so he's really one of my ex-students. Um, and I will tell you a little bit about his career. Before I say that, I want to uh, sort of transfer to you a personal um, uh, comment about his experience here at LSU uh, that I transfer occasionally to the next generation of students. So, uh, so basically, Rafael was responsible for transferring high-level mutagenesis protocols using bacterial artificial chromosomes from Dr. S.J. Gao's laboratory, at the time located at UT San Antonio. And uh, he was sent there uh, to spend about a month or so uh, learning the process and uh, bring it back to LSU. And of course, that lab had very intense, high-level intensity, um, having a lot of internationals, um, Asian and other um, people from China, and I told uh, Rafael when he goes there, he'd be the first person, he should be the first person to open the lab and the last person to leave the lab because they, he had to create an impression. So Rafael called me two or three days later. He said, Gus, this is impossible. I, I show up at six o'clock, everybody's there, and I leave past midnight and still everybody's there. <laughs> but he ended up losing about 30 pounds in about a month. And since then, S.J. Gao has been one of his biggest supporters, writing recommendation letters and so on. So it's a lesson that really hard work ultimately pays by creating these relationships. Anyway, Rafael is currently uh, the Associate Dean at the Morrissey College of Arts and Sciences at Boston College. He also uh, has other titles, including the Director of the Pre-Health Program, the Director of the Gateway Scholars Program for STEM. And before that, um, he did his postdoc work at Harvard working on structural biology using NMR techniques to understand uh, translation initiation. And he had other duties, including helping PP for academic affairs for promotion packages. He served as the, importantly, as the director of the NRMN, the National Research Mentoring uh, uh, Program Grant that really covered 50 states, recruiting and investing in mentoring um, our students, uh, especially from uh, uh, in under, uh, underrepresented minorities. He, uh, uh, his claim to fame is beyond really the academic credentials because uh, when he was at Harvard, he was part of an effort uh, to uh, initiate uh, scientific storytelling. And at Harvard, they noticed that certain publications that were uh, really great findings, they were not very readable and they wouldn't deliver the impact that it was supposed to be delivered. So they created this office of scientific storytelling to really reformat those papers so they could be better read. So that experience, um, we was transferred. Uh, Raphael was part of the leaders in there. And he actually published a book uh, that we have multiple copies that we give to our graduate students, Scientific Storytelling by Raphael Luna, which is really how do you present, how do you write a paper, how you create titles, and beyond that, and he actually delivered that at Student Union a few years back here with over 250 people attending in his, in his uh, seminar. And he gives that thing throughout the world. In addition to that, I will tell you that Rafael is finishing his MBA at Boston College, as well as his, his master's degree in theology. And he's actually taking classics right now, including, he told me, uh, Greek. Hopefully it's ancient Greek, not modern ones, but <laughs> anyway. So without further ado, Rafael, it's all yours. All right, thank you. Thanks for that great introduction, Gus. Um, Gus is, um, you know, started in the lab with Gus when I was an undergrad at Southern University on the Howard Hughes uh, scholarship that funded my research. I joined his lab and I remember him talk. I still remember that day walking, it was upstairs on the third floor and walking me around the labs and we talked about herpes and all different types of viruses. And um, he said, yeah, sure, join, join the lab. And, and that's when I met Mika here, who's part of the EAC as well. He was in the lab and, and Vladimir, 
And it was just such a rich time of learning and, and growing, exploring. And so for the students that are undergrads and grad students, says, what can I do? You know, would I have any ideas? But one of the biggest things I would recommend, like looking back, if I had to do it again, just to remind you that questions do matter. So when you're at that age, you know, of undergrad and your training or even postdocs, your questions are really important because maybe you're not biased by all what's in the textbooks with those circular pictures sometimes, or they have pictures and mechanisms, which may or may not be true, right? And so um, your questions, why is that? You know, can we look at it this, this way? What about this? And sometimes, you know, when you're young, you're like, oh, I can't ask this question because um, I might sound stupid or, or dumb or, or it's not an intelligent question. But I, I, I would say um, it would be unintelligent not to ask because that's where uh, science leads to discovery. And so I'm really honored today to, to talk and always love coming back to ba uh, Baton Rouge, his family. Um, and everyone in the biomed is like family to me. So I really appreciate that. And it's always a, a welcoming home here and at Southern. So the, the workforce has changed. It's really uh, uh, difficult to get your, public, your papers published. And if you're sitting in this audience and um, you're a faculty member, maybe a graduate student, you may have had your papers um, uh, rejected a, a time or two. And it always seems like to me, it's always reviewer number three that just have the most scaling <laughs> reviews. Just like, ah, oh, do they really have to say that? It was already rejected. Just you don't have to pile it on, right? So, um, and, and so this was started when my paper was rejected. Um, I worked about almost like six and a half years, and you know, living the dream at Harvard Med and just trying to get my papers published. And it just kept adding more data and more data, and the team just kept getting bigger and bigger. Our collaborators from NIH. Uh, John Lorsch was one of our collaborators. He was at Hopkins at the time. Alan Hinnebush from NIH as well was one of my collaborators. And from Kansas State, a professor at Kansas State, uh, uh, Kasura Sano, which also has an idea grant over there in Kansas. So we're working with him as well. And um, a faculty member at BU Medical School. And it just kept getting bigger. And as the postdoc and the, the, the lead on the, on the work, it was like, well, let's just do some more experiments, Rafael. Why don't you test this? Why don't you test that? And then at, you know, after six years, you start getting tired of testing things. And I said, can we just wrap this up? And what's the story here? And it just kept coming back to me. It's like, well, you tell us, what is the story? And we did submit the paper to sell. It was rejected. And with that, it felt like they rejected my heart. My heart was there rejected as well. And I was upset, just like, wow, how could this be? We have all this great data. The data was beautiful to, in my eyes. You know, beauty is in the eyes of the beholder because in my eyes, it was beautiful, but not in reviewer three's eyes. Reviewer one and two, they were, no, re, reviewer one loved it. Reviewer two was on the fence, but reviewer three just seemed not to like it very much. Um, and then so I, um, I was a little bit sad for a couple of weeks. And then I remember Gus, every time I got sad in the lab, he would take me, go play soccer, you know, and. Um, and if you ever play soccer with Gus, uh, make sure you wear pads because uh, he will run you over. So, um, and it was more like a rugby match, but uh, so I went to go play basketball, start uh, playing basketball, working out. And I found that, you know, just wait a second. What, how did I get here? And then one of my collaborators, uh, Hari Babu Altanari, who's now a professor at Harvard Med, he was my fellow postdoc, uh, co-author on the paper and says, Raf, why don't you just go back to what you did in the beginning? All these stories of, that you did with uh, uh, putting your science into stories since you were a freshman at, at Southern University that led you to get the highest GPA in biology after not doing so well at two other universities before, but starting all over at Southern. And then what helped me to really do really well at LSU is just put those into stories. Put this into a story, Raf. You can do this. And so this is my, the journey. And so then I asked, what is a story? So, you know, kind of distilled it down to like conflict resolution, um, which is like uh, solving for the unknown, logical series of events, and send it on a protagonist. But how does this relate to science? And then with our main character protagonist, uh, is where it's irrevocably changed. And what you're studying, the object that you're studying, should, you, know, you should learn something about that. 
And then so when you, after you learn about your molecule, your virus, your gene, your protein, your RNA, you should never be able to look at that protein ever again the same because you learned something about it. And then no one else, if you communicate it correctly, no one else should be able to look at that molecule as well. Whether it's oncolytic herpes viruses, they can see for effects or whatever it may be. And so then we looked at what's the hypothesis? Just nothing, fifth grade definition of an educated guess. And, and so when I was at Harvard Med, uh, I was talking to some of the deans there and I was a postdoc and at the uh, office of postdoctoral affairs, you know, just kind of, I started scratching, you know, putting on the paper, you know, what if we uh, juxtapose scientific research with the scientific story? How would that look like if we juxtapose hypothesis validation with conflict resolution? So we did a, a dramatic arc um, in the form of energy of activation barrier. And so here we see um, the hypothesis. Uh, and then from there, we'll increase the tension points with more evidence. Each figure one, figure two, figure three, reach, reach the highest tension. Then after that, you should be able to start predicting what's gonna happen with your validation experiments. If your tension points one, two, three, and the highest tension point are um, correct, and then you should uh, resolve your hypothesis. And so here I had this behemoth of a, of a paper uh, that was rejected. It was some 80 some pages long. And I, you know, after I started putting on my story ten lens, I almost felt bad for the reviewers. How do they read like 88 pages with like about 20 figures? I, 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 I felt bad for them. I burdened them with my results. I just threw everything at them, which wasn't fair to them. So probably that's what I was probably experiencing from reviewer three. So I said, okay, let's, re let's redo this paper. And so I'm staring at the blank computer screen. What's the first thing that I should do? And so then what I came up was, let's start with the title. And because, and then from there, I said, let's start editing the abstract, the figures, the results, and discussion intro. And now when you're writing your papers, there are a lot of people that do it different ways. Like my professor at, uh, who's my, um, uh, uh, my uh, postdoc uh, advisor, he loves to start with uh, the figures. But I like starting with uh, the titles because it's just about 130 characters and you can edit that 10, 20 times. And the time that it takes to edit that is a lot quicker than it would be for the figures. And then so same for the abstract. And so when we, um, I said, how can I put a storytelling title? Can we put our title into a story? Because when you're, Scanning, when you do a, a PubMed search, you'll get 200, 200, 300 articles. And, you know, how many of us will read those 200, 300 articles? Um, I don't know about you guys, but I, I didn't, I wouldn't read the 200, 300 articles. But I would read all the titles. And the titles that get me, I would probably, you know, start reading those abstracts. And then I would dig a little bit further. The abstracts that move me or that's relevant, I would read those, um, look at the figures and read the manuscripts. And so basically, I looked at the title as, you know, can we have a concluding statement that summarizes our paper? So in basically an elevator pitch, can we have our entire research summarized within the title? And so, yes, you can read the abstract for more information, look at the figures for even additional detail and in-depth information, and then you can read the results if you're, you know, if you're in that field that you want to go further in that research. So how do you distill years of professional work into one sentence? And so that's what we came up with, uh, putting some parameters. Uh, we use uh, six words, the protagonist, antagonist, conflict, scene, resolution, and stakes. And we try to attribute one word for each of these uh, uh, titles and these mesh words. And then, we, then we'll jam them together and rearrange them into forming a title. And so this was my first. Um, this is my first time doing a, a, a storytelling title with that paper that I had. Um, so here, the C terminal domain of eukaryotic initiation factor five, that's my protagonist, that's my main character, that's what I'm studying, that I was studying at the time. This is the paper that was initially rejected. Um, then that's the protagonist. And then the resolution was a form of active verb, promotes. Um, my antagonists were EF1 and EF2 beta. You know, that's what was interacted on EIF5. Um, the, dy uh, the dynamic interplay is the conflict. 
and the start code of recognition is the scene. That lets us know it's on the 40S subunit in the decoding box um, on the ribosome. And that's also the stakes. In order to have these three words, I needed um, from years four to six, I needed two years of experiments just to put those three little words in there. So EI5 promotes start code of recognition by the this dynamic interplay with EIF1 and EIF2 beta. And so you just interact with EIF1. And, and then so what we did was just map the entire paper onto this uh, uh, figure here. So basically we have here EIF5, the C terminal domain of it. it we, we match the NMR, the, the binding interface on EIF5 with EIF1. And then we look at EIF5 with EIF2 beta, the internal domain, which is unstructured but we can see where it binds on EI5 and it's overlapping. So the question is like, which one's more important? You know, do they all bind together? Um, do they bind sequentially? So we did isothermal titration calorimetry to see that EI2 beta and EI5 bind and have curves, uh, nice uh, curves and release heat. But EI1 and EI5, they, they don't bind tight enough to, to measure an ITC. So we, we know that EIF5 and EIF2 beta are the strong interaction. And then in coll collaboration with John Lorsch, we're able to see, um, he did this um, yeast in vitro biochemistry suit where we can see wild type, um, the, uh, you know, dissociation curves. And we can see that um, once we start mutating it, then we can see it drop off together. That's how we knew. And then with yeast assays, we were able to um, um, measure our mutants and our quad mutants. We, four, we did four point mutation of the EIF5, c term domain, and then we were able to see this. So this was our climax experiment. We kind of predicted the results that we'll have here. And, um, and then right at year six and going on to six and a half, my collaborator, and Alan Hennebush says, well, if the mechanism is right, Raf, and you really believe it's working, then before we submit, um, we should do one more experiment. We should experiment that if really when before the ribosomal head um, closes. So the, the 40S subunit is anthropomorphic as a head, neck, shoulder. And so the mRNA comes on like a scarf uh, onto the neck. And right at the Adam's apples, the, the um, star codon and the head shuts down. So he said, if that's the case, then EIF1 comes off when the head closes, we should be able to predict exactly what happens with the uh, mutagenesis. I said, um, do we really need to do this experiment? Can't that be in the subsequent paper? And I tried as a postdoc. He said, no worry, Rap. We'll do it in our lab. You don't have to do it. All you have to do is just be patient. Can you just be patient? And six years of a postdoc, it's hard to be patient when you're in postdoc six years. And you have a daughter. And you got your, your family obligations. So uh, those of you that are lit, you know, fighting the good fight and, and you're doing your research, it, it's worth to kind of be patient. But it's hard when you really need to get that extra experiment. And so um, we waited for it and we were able to predict our, to the point of mutagenesis that exactly our quad mute has the biggest effect and then we we're able to map it. But when I saw this, you know, Gus, you know, you know, there's no way you can meet Gus and work with him without being effusive with your emotions, whether it's a hug, an embrace, um, you know, crying, laughing, it's, it's, you're not gonna be around Gus without um, uh, moving. And so I got really comfortable with my feelings. And then so when I Harvard Med, when I saw these results, I just started to cry. It was just so beautiful. We were able to see that. And so um, I hope that um, I had that a couple of times uh, in my life, once in, uh, you know, working with S.J. Gow in that lab to seeing the beautiful work from uh, Capote Sarcoma and back, uh, back law, um, in backs, but then also here. And it was just a beautiful experience because then I knew my paper was going to get accepted. And so we submitted it to cell reports. And then it's exactly the same thing. This took about five minutes to put the title together. And it's the title that lasted in there. And it has the uh, protagonist. Um, the first line promotes the uh, resolution, start code of recognition, seeing the stakes. Dynamic interplay is conflict, EIF1 and EIF2 beta are the antagonists. And so then there was a paper published in uh, Nature Immunology, which actually mapped this. We use this method to map that as well. And so your reader will, will remember uh, this, uh, your research if you put it into a story. And I am under this uh, it, you know, suggestion that, I would like to suggest to you that, you know, if you have really good research, it makes a beautiful story. And so your hypothesis and abstract present, prevent your research stories from becoming headless monsters. 
And that's what I threw at those um, reviewers with that cell reviewers. You know, they had to read my mon monstrosity of a paper. I felt bad after I put it, in, you know, into um, my uh, the storytelling method because I realized I had three papers in one. So out of that one paper, we were able to get three papers out. And so the reviewers, they were actually reading three papers in one, but it wasn't into a cohesive story. And so just another example, we have this EIF4E drug, uh, EIF4E4G uh, inhibitor 4 egi one And so this drug right here, this molecule, and, um, and so what happens is that this molecule will bind in between EI4E and 4G. Uh, and there's a natural protein called 4EBP that does this itself in your, inside each of your cells. Um, but this drug can interrupt the um, dissociate EI4E from 4G. And that's important because the 4G is what brings the messenger RNA to the, to the 40S ribosome. So they had this work. And so after I gave my talk, I came up with this method and my, my postdoc advisor said, okay, Raf, you're traveling all over Europe, Germany, Aust uh, Austria, uh, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, you're going to all these places. Can you make sure my lab knows how to do it? I said, yeah, I've been working with them. Say, no, give the same presentation. So I gave a presentation about my scientific storytelling. Then he calls me into his office. And I was like, oh, is this where I'm gonna get the pink slip? It's year six and a half. And I was like, oh, I'm like, this may not work. We're almost year seven as a postdoc. I was like, this is it. I guess I'm going into his office. He's like, wow. Then he closes the door behind him and says, uh, uh, Raphael, I'm, you know, we have this paper. We have a 4EG, the space field molecule, and we have um, the EI4E and uh, the structure right here, the secondary structure, ribbons and the, and the, uh, the beta pleated sheets in gray. He says, so I ask you, Mr. Storyteller, and uh, he said that with a little bit of um, a smirk on his face, tell me which one's the protagonist. And I said, oh, I have no idea what your paper is. I've been focusing on my own research. This is not my work. I don't know. And it's already 5.15. I gave the talk. I was exhausted. And, um, and he was just like, well, no, you need to tell me which one is the protagonist. So I ask you here, which one's the protagonist? Is it EI4E, the protein, or is it the drug? So, you know, you feel free to raise your hand. It could be a little interactive. Um, you can stand up and shout if you want. Some people say the drug, right? Right? Some people say drug. Anyone say protein? Protein, anyone? Can we get one protein here? And, all right. Thank you. Thank you. We got two proteins here. All right. Um, so that's a good question. So, so what I asked him, I said, I don't know the research. I know that there was a fellow postdoc doing that work. But um, I asked you, I said, well, let me ask these questions. Which one changes? He says, well, what do you mean? I said, that's how we're going to identify the protagonist. And so which one changes? Does the drug change? Um, if we look back, I said, well, does these uh, benzene rings open up? It's like, nope, NMR, they, we don't see anything. I said, the side, you know, the side groups, do they change at all or they get modified? Nope. You know, do they break in half? You know, it's like, no, we don't see any of that. I said, do they multimerize it? No, we don't see any of, of that. It stays the same. Oh, okay. So that in my mind, immediately, I said, that must be an antagonist. And most of the narratives, um, the antagonists stay the same. It's only the protagonist changes. I said, okay, well, what about the protein? Does that change? He says, interesting, you asked me that. So let's look again at EI4E um, in gray. And when you see the drug there bind, this alpha helix is extensive alpha helix, and it knocks off allosterically uh, the EI4G peptide. And, uh, and so... And so now I said, well, if that's the case, then EI4E must be the protagonist. He says, no, Raphael, you're wrong. It has to be the drug. And I was like, okay, great. So now I'm, you know, I realized I wasn't being fired at the moment. So I got a little bit more bold with him. I said, I said, I guess, I said, I, I, I said, uh, Gerhard, you know, I was thinking in my mind, he has, he has 494 publications. And to get those 494, he's always started with his figures. He starts with his figures, and then he would always, you know, write everything else up, the results, the introduction, and discussion. I, and I said, I said, Gerhard, the, based off what you're telling me, just based off of this couple of minute conversation, your protagonist is the EI4E. 
He says, no, no, let me show you all these figures. I said, no, I don't need to see all those figures. He pulled out 17 figures and we would have been there all evening. And not, as big as I am, I need to eat. I said, this is dinner time. I said, we're not going to mess up my food here. And so I, was, I didn't say that to him. I was thinking, I said, no, we need to wrap this meeting up quick. And so, um, and so I said, this is your protagonist is changing. And he says, but don't you want to see the data? I said, no, I don't need to see the data. It has to, if it changes, if it does have the, uh, the extension, then that changes. And he says, well, I don't know if I believe that. I said, that's fine then. You don't have to use a method. You know, and, and in my mind, the whole, I had the whole Louisiana thing, well, God bless you. You know, but I, <laughs> I, I didn't say it. So, I, you know, I wanted to keep my job. And so I said, okay, well, that's fine. You don't have to use a method. That's all right. But he was struggling for a year and a half to get this paper published. Kept getting rejected. They, they kept adding more figures and more figures. He had 17 figures for a science and nature paper. And you don't need that many figures. And so um, eventually he did, um, he, he did listen. He says, okay, that's great. If you're right, that's great. And, um, uh, he says, well, if that's the case, let's, let's confirm this by doing point metagenesis on every single face of the surface of the, of the EI4E. And Raph, you're going to do those mutagenesis. And I was just like, great. So there's no good deed that goes undone. I got on the paper, but then I spent about another month, felt like I was at SJ Gow's lab again, where it barely, all I did was grow protein up and bacteria and, and lice them. And so it was quite exhausting. I got on the paper and um, then we published it in PNAS. And funny, about a month and a half later, there, there was going to be a paper published in Nature, but nope, not anymore. It was molecules and cells because um, we were able to get there first. And then after that, there was a couple other papers. So um, we got in PNAS, but it did feel good for us um, if you don't win the championship to stop other people like, uh, like USC. You know, they didn't get to the championship, but they stopped two teams from getting to the championship. That's basically what we did. Uh, we stopped two other teams from getting the science and nature. If I didn't get my cell paper, there was nobody else going to get these science and nature papers. And that felt pretty good for us. So USC should also be pretty proud. Got a page. Yeah, and that, that's, that's great too, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I need to get one of those too, so I need, I need to talk to him. And so then afterwards, we were able to uh, work on more uh, manuscripts. And so here, we had my friend, uh, Harry Barbaratanari says, okay, Raf, I followed your method, I did. I said, but he says, you know, here's the paper, we already got it accepted. And I said, well, that's a great title, but you got too many words in there. And says, he said, what do you mean? He says, you follow the method, but you didn't even uh, uh, consult me. And so what, what two words here are just not even necessary? That is, you don't even need that in there. And he was like, oh, I said, don't worry, Harry. I'm going to use you in my example when I talk all over. And, and says, you'll be in my slides. He said, no, don't do that. So don't worry. So don't, you don't have to worry. I'll give you credit. I will give you credit for it. He was like, um, and so then we, uh, when I was in Austria giving a talk, this, this paper um, was in one of my classes uh, and the student says, can you tell me why this was published? It was supposed to be unpublished work when I was workshopping, but he has, so I, I read this paper, it was a beautiful paper and I couldn't find anything wrong. It was, it was written in the story. And I was like, well, why isn't this paper in Cell Science Nature? But then it has um, non-ribosome peptide, it has the protagonist causes. I wouldn't use the word cause, it may be induced, but they used it, it got through. Um, that's the resolution. Uh, endotoxicity is the conflict, and antibiotics associated colitis is the scene and the stakes. But what's missing is the antagonist. So when I read the paper at, like at uh, uh, two in the morning with jet lag in Austria, and I was like, maybe I finally read the, the first perfect paper. But I was like, no, um, Gus em embedded in me a, a, a certain amount of uh, skepticism. I said, I don't believe in a perfect manuscript. That can't be. So then I read it with the storytelling eyes, then I was able to see it didn't have the, anta uh, the antagonist. So if you have a peptide without the antagonist, that means if you don't know where this peptide binds to the receptor, you don't have the mechanism. And so right there, that's like, oh, that's why it's not published in Cell Science Nature. So that was quick. That was in a matter of a couple of minutes. But I already read it and spent like an hour and a half reading the paper when I could have just found that out a little easier. And then here we use two, uh, two, uh, uh, two protagonists, EI5 uh, uh, factor 1A and 5. That was like Hansel and Gretel. Um, that's like, uh, they have two protagonists. And then this one here, we spent um, a lot of time at Starbucks uh, working with a, a, a postdoc from George Whiteside's lab at Harvard. And here, 
this is the first time we use magnetic levitation. We use a process. Um, it took us so long to figure out a title because I didn't realize we could use a process as a protagonist, and that's magnetic levitation. And that was in Agavanti, and it helped these uh, people move on with their postdocs. Then we published in a couple others. And this one's interesting. Uh, this one came up with, he, he sent me this paper and it didn't have a title or abstract. I said, didn't you read my book? He said, yeah, but I started on chapter three. I was like, well, on chapter, uh, I think it's chapter two, we go over the, uh, the titles and abstracts. You need to have that. No, we'll put it afterwards. We'll retrofit fit it. I said, no, read the book. And then so he read the book, chapters two, and uh, I think it's chapters two. And then he came up with Slice because basically he had an invisible protagonist. I was like, no, you need to name that. Um, and so he came up with Slice and that led him to getting uh, promoted um, and moving on to being a professor at Iowa State, but now he's at NC State. And then here's some others that use the method uh, from a workshop uh, in PNAS and JAX. Um, they didn't, I didn't even work with them. They just read the book and, and published their paper in JAX. They were also having a hard time getting the paper published. And this one, this guy, uh, uh, Karsten Voll, uh, he caught me at a, a seminar in Germany and chased me down before I had to catch the German train, which runs on time. So I didn't want to miss it. It's not like Amtrak where you can kind of show up a little bit, like a minute or two. And so we kind of knocked out his title in, uh, in about five, uh, 15 minutes, made the t uh, train on time. But then um, he sent me this paper a couple of years later that it was published and he was really happy with the same title. And here's um, uh, a paper that was also used the method and nature biomedical engineering. And so now we go back to Hari Bhagavatanari. So I close with this. And so here he tells me again, he says, Raph, I finally used your method again, but this time the title is beautiful and it's in nature. So check, check it out. And so I look at it and I'm like, well, um, couldn't really find the protagonist. I didn't really know what the, the resolution is, but I really like the title. So then I had to learn here from this nature paper that maybe you don't need the, the, all the, the methods, but maybe like the protagonist, protagonist conflict scene resolution stakes could help you while you're drafting the paper, but when you're making the final cut and you need like 77 characters, you know, put the words that are really important that so people can find your manuscript. So, um, and, um, and then I think that was basically it. And so it's published in Paris. It's kind of, sounds kind of harsh, but what I found is just find a way to end those stories. Um, and you might have to do an extra figure or you may not, right? Maybe a second paper. But you definitely don't want to have three papers in one and assault your reviewers with that paper. You know, be kind to your reviewers if you want them. You know, if you want someone to be kind to you, you should be kind to them. So be kind to your reviewers. I know it's kind of odd to say that, but um, if they really enjoy the, 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 your manuscript and remember that story, they're going to go to sleep at. Uh, I know Gus, uh, Gus, he reviews manuscripts with wine at night. So if he's happy drinking wine and reading your story and going to bed, you want them to sleep and dream about your manuscript as beautiful or whatever your work is. And so, um, you know, when I look back at all the people that I worked with, they made this, um, this hall of fame for me, this wall of fame. And I didn't realize there was so much people with diversity um, from all over the world, from Denmark, uh, physicians, uh, Israeli scientists, Austrian, uh, uh, Harvard Med, I mean, Harvard University of Physics, Biomedical Engineering. And so um, I just really enjoyed the, the journey with all of them. And I just want to uh, thank Gus, uh, and Brent and John and also uh, Danielle for like just organizing this talk, um, this meeting and just making it nice and easy for me to show up and, and enjoy all the great talks that are here today. Well, thank you very much and I appreciate the time.